Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for April 23rd, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Towards Security Managed Virtual Science Networks with just Jeff Chase and Paul Ruth. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. So if you click on the little chat icon, uh, you can type questions there. I'm just doing a sample there to show you. Um, and uh, we, will take, we will have time at the end of the presentation as well for questions. And with that, I wanted to welcome uh, Jeff and Paul. Jeff and Paul, welcome. Thank you. Yep, keep going. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, we need to grab the screen. We need to grab the screen, right. Now. right so share screen. It's this one. Yeah. Yep, we could see that. Looks good. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all for attending, and thanks, Jeanette. Um, I'm Jeff Chase. I'm in computer science at Duke University. Um, Paul is here with me. Um, he's at RENC at UNC Chapel Hill. And what we're going to talk about is um, work that's involved a, a bunch of collaborators, students at Duke and uh, other folks at RENC. Um, Nick Baraglio at ESNet is also working with us. And we have some, uh, some folks from um, Duke's OIT as well who are working with us on this project. And all of the work that we're talking about is funded by the National Science Foundation um, through some grants both on the cyber infrastructure side and uh, some of the infrastructure that we're building on, which involves more collaborators, is based on our work with uh, Genie. So we have been involved with uh, Genie for some time and uh, have been uh, we're using a part of Genie called uh, ExoGenie for a lot of this work. That's one of the two RACS deployments in Genie, and that is um, uh, overseen by RENCI, and we're heavily involved with that. Um, okay, so the, the foundation for what we're doing and the foundation for, for Genie and ExoGenie are the uh, network circuit fabric capabilities that we have through uh, you know, national footprint research networks like Internet2, and the uh, AL2S deployment and uh, ESNet. So these provide a programmatic API. They're infrastructure providers. Uh, they let one allocate point-to-point -point L2 pipes for sending uh, network traffic, bandwidth provisioned, edge-to-edge, uh, -edge, linking campuses and various kinds of uh, facilities, you know, major cyber infrastructure sites, and so on. So for Genie and, and uh, for this work, uh, we use these APIs to, um, to allocate the bandwidth the pipes for the bandwidth that we need and to use those to build um, virtual assemblages of resources. Now, one question for the circuits is, uh, how do we actually attach high-speed circuits into resources that are on campuses or on facilities? And it's been a, a goal there for a while to have a friction-free network path. Uh, you know, there, there are security appliances and so on on the edges of the campus IP networks that can really slow down traffic coming in from these big pipes at high speed. So DOE, the, the labs have been working on that for a while. They've uh, promoted this idea of science DMZs and under NSF cyber infrastructure funding, a lot of campuses have been deploying variants of science DMZs. Uh, so the idea of a science DMZ is to uh, try to store data as it comes in outside of the campus edge and then let it trickle in. And we are actually pursuing a alternative or complementary approach, which a number of campuses are now also deploying, called uh, SDN bypass, that allows subnets on the campuses to stitch directly into a circuit. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, here's just a picture. This is an ESNet uh, DOE picture about uh, Science DMZ. And the idea there is that data comes in at high speed on that blue line there on the left through a circuit. And uh, 
goes into this uh, DMZ that's on the outside of the campus edge and is stored on high speed storage nodes. And then uh, it can come into, it can be fetched from resources inside the campus through whatever the campus IP network looks like. So the alternative view, this, this shows you what that little half moon icon was on, the, uh, on a previous slide. This is a picture of uh, Duke's campus, sort of the cartoon version. But there are multiple circuit providers that come in at the campus edge. And what we have done is we've deployed uh, an SDN network that kind of bypasses the campus IP network. And so circuits that come in, they hit a switch in the SDN network. And various science-related uh, subnets on the Duke campus have SDN switches deployed that are their gateways to the campus IP network. And so what we can do is when, it, when a new circuit appears on the edge, we can uh, um, you know, hit, hit an SD, SDN control plane API and link that up so that communications between an IP prefix and a local subnet and some remote IP, IP prefix are automatically shunted onto the circuit through the SDN network and onto the circuit bypassing the core. And uh, Duke has deployed a, a science DMZ solution that's, that's on the SDN network there. And there are other sites that are connected through. So the idea there is to uh, enable sort of opt-in subnet to subnet connectivity over these circuits. And we are uh, presuming that capability on campuses uh, broadly as part of the work uh, that we're doing and that we're describing here. So the idea is that once we have these circuits and we can interconnect them with campuses, we can interconnect them with other kinds of facilities, you know, big leadership computing facilities, uh, clusters. Um, we can connect them with uh, virtual resources, what are called slices, running in Genie and also in the uh, NSF's NSF cloud sites uh, like Chameleon. And so the idea is that we've got all these different resources and subnets on campuses that what we can do is actually create assemblages of circuits and resources on the edges here and maybe in the network to create a complete virtual science network on demand. So this is not a vision that's unique to us. People in uh, varying degrees have been pursuing this vision for many years. I think it's uh, um, the, in DOE nowadays, it's sometimes called a super facility that you can uh, assemble uh, a, a virtual network and, bandwidth provision pipes that link multiple sites in this way. So it can support cross-campus collaborations, maybe involving multiple campuses, um, access to facilities for those collaborations, uh, sharing of those resources. And, and also we're interested in pursuing uh, security managed abstractions for managing sensitive research data. This idea of virtual data enclaves or research data networks is um, gaining, gaining traction. These are networks that are private and managed uh, or authorized specifically to, as a basis for sharing sensitive data and where access is denied from outside uh, without proper authorization and, and they're very protected against leakage of that data. So looking on the right side of the slide, if we're going to deploy these kinds of virtual networks, we are going to need some support inside the network or with edge resources that allow us to implement routing control uh, at the IP level above a stitched layer two underlay made up of these pipes. Um, and also to perform you know, various kinds of uh, appliances for network function virtualization, security monitoring and so on. We have to manage the peering of these virtual networks with their customers on the edge. And as the needs change, uh, we want to be able to adapt to the topology and the resources uh, on the fly, uh, including linkages to edge clouds. So the security managed part of that is uh, basically just taking the view that once you deploy a virtual network service provider like this, a virtual network, it is a live network service uh, built to order to meet the needs of a particular research community. It has customers attached to it. It's a multi-domain uh, network service right, from, from edge to edge. So there are a lot of security issues that come up there because, you know, when these circuits come into the campuses, if we use the SDN bypass approach, they are by design bypassing campus security. Uh, certainly in-band campus security appliances like firewalls and uh, uh, in-line appliances like firewalls and the intrusion protection and so on. 
So we have to manage access control to peering. We want to make sure that anybody who advertises prefixes into one of these networks is actually authorized to do that. And at the other side, that to prove that the network is actually authorized to carry traffic to a particular prefix. And we want to be able to allow uh, declarative policies for customers to control who can connect in and uh, how these networks are stitched together. And within the network, um, as I mentioned, we, we want to be able to deploy various kinds of security enhancement services. The experiments that we're doing now deploys out of band uh, bro IPS devices inside the network uh, so that the traffic is, is mirrored to uh, elastic bro appliances that are deployed within virtual machines in order to do scanning outside without interfering with the, uh, the bandwidth that we can get over those pipes. So going forward, the idea is uh, that we have various kinds of threat aware scanning that are deployed either inside the network provider or on uh, computation resources inside the network and that are uh, identifying threats and responding to those threats by controlling traffic, you know, by blocking flows that look dangerous or uh, studying what attackers are doing and so on. So that's the idea, security managed virtual networks. Um, and this is sort of a, you know, it's a continuation of the Genie vision. Actually, it's been a vision for quite some time. Uh, and a number of folks have put forward various variations of this kind of vision. And one that I particularly like and want to just point at is um, one of the leaders and a couple of leaders in, in network research community, uh, Jennifer Rexford, Nick Feimster, about a little more than 10 years ago, put forward this idea of CABO, uh, which is uh, concurrent architectures are better than one. And the idea was that the future internet architecture really should be that we decouple infrastructure providers. We have infrastructure providers for clouds and networking. And then on top of that, we deploy these service providers. So this is sort of an economic refactoring that we kind of decouple these. And the idea behind CABO, and, and not unique to CABO, but I think this slide, Nick Feimster's slide from a CABO presentation more than 10 years ago, uh, summarizes uh, very well what the, what the big idea is here, that in the sort of internet as we have it today, you have competing IP networks, autonomous systems that all have to link together and coordinate in order to provide end-to-end uh, -end service quality or other kinds of uh, value-added services. And so the CABO model and the model that we're pursuing is that a service provider can allocate resources from the multiple infrastructure providers. That's what those little red boxes are there. Uh, so it has sort of a little piece on each of the infrastructure providers and pipes so that they're all linked together. And then it can deploy, first of all, it can control the usage of those pipes because they're bandwidth provisioned, reserved and dedicated. And also it can control what kinds of processing and routing happens in line. So it's a complete end-to-end -end virtual network that can provide edge-to-edge -edge services with various kinds of value added, including security management and quality of service. Um, Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the summary. This slide kind of repeats some things that I've said. Um, we want to make these built-to-order virtual science networks edge-to-edge -edge so we can link science resources on campuses and in the labs um, according to the needs of particular communities and also be able to incorporate new forms of security management into that based on declarative policy. We want to be able to say what the security requirements are what kinds of scanning should be enabled, you know, the NFV service chains and so on. And there's a lot of work in the network community now pursuing ways of uh, specifying policies for enterprise networks, and it's all pertinent here. So a lot of the security management uh, is based on the safe logical trust system that uh, I've been building with my students and um, collaborators here, here at Duke uh, for, a, uh, for a few years. And I'll talk about that toward the end of the presentation but of course, the, the, all of this work is based on the national research fabrics, um, AL2S, ESnet, and other NSF-funded cyber infrastructure. And in particular, what we're doing now, you know, we're trying to assemble an architecture and a platform for building and deploying these virtual networks according to the vision from Cabo and others. Um, and what we are doing now is building and assembling prototypes for that based on Genie and in particular, Exogenie. So that actually does, you know, Exogenie is now a couple of years old. These are um, 
Uh, we're running virtual machines. The bros, for example, run in virtual machines. We have virtual routers, SDN controlled routers running in virtual machines, um, you know, open vSwitch. And that does slow things down a little bit. So we're not running at full bandwidth of the pipes. Um, but going forward, um, many of us have been working toward pursuing a, a vision for a future uh, NSF CI that would enable more flexible and more powerful forms of uh, in-network, uh, deep network programmability and uh, other kinds of in-network facilities um, integrated with uh, the research fabrics to be able to build <coughs> production deployments that are more capable than what we can do today with uh, Genie. Um, but right now we are using ExoGenie. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Paul, who's gonna talk a little bit about ExoGenie and some of the platform and prototype on ExoGenie. All right, so uh, this section of the talk, we're gonna talk about ExoGenie, as Jeff said, a um, little background on it and how, and how we're using it. So what ExoGenie is, some of you might be familiar, but um, we'll give you a little background anyway. It's a, about 23 OpenStack cloud sites that are spread out around the world, really wide footprint. Um, most of them are in the US at different academic institutions and some other research institutions. But um, there's also RECs in Amsterdam and Sydney, Australia and Peru and Canada. Um, and what they are is they are small OpenStack sites, about 10 physical compute nodes on each site. Um, they work just like any cloud provider would that you might use, you can get virtual machines and um, storage from them. Um, and they use the uh, they use the Genie API. Um, the, the special thing about them is that they use the Genie API, so you can you, you can use them um, in the same way that you would use any of the Genie sites um, that are part of the federation. Uh, another special special sauce about this, though, is that you can not only get um, virtual machines and virtual storage, but we have relationships with all of the uh, network transit providers. So you can get um, circuits that's, that connect these different racks together um, in the same way that you would get virtual machines. Um, so now we have this, this federated infrastructure where you can get virtual machines spread across a wide footprint, you can get compute or storage across a wide footprint, and you can connect them with dynamic circuits um, across the wide footprint. Um, so, uh, how does it how does this work? Well, um, users can come to Genie or ExoGenie specifically, and they can request a slice of resources that um, are that are embedded into the uh, the topology, the available topology. So, uh, a user might come in and ask for four virtual machines in this example um, on four specific racks that they that they've chosen and um, have. Uh, circuits that are connected, connecting these sites in whatever way, um, whatever topology they wish for whatever their experiment is. Um, and all of this is automated. So they come with a declarative statement about what kind of topology they want. They hand it over to Genie or ExoGenie, and we embed their topology into the available topology and instantiate all the resources and insert some of their keys and hand them back a bunch of IP addresses with nodes that they can now access and do their their experiment. Um, this is also dynamic and elastic, so you can change your slice over time um, to add nodes, remove nodes, add circuits, this kind of thing. Um, uh, the elastic part of the, uh, or one of the, the benefits of Exogenie is we have this Ahab controller, or Ahab uh, library that allows you to create controllers that will control your slice. So with, what Ahab is is the Java library that, that allows you to programmatically create and destroy and modify um, slices on Exogenie. Um, so this will allow you to provision new virtual machines or new pipes or delete pipes or adapt the, and generally adapt the slice over time. Um, we can also on Exogenie have what we call inter-slice stitching. So this is a, an interesting thing that um, is not generally available on Genie, but Exogenie um, makes this available. So you can have multiple slices um, potentially owned by different users, and you can we can stitch them together at layer two. And um, this seems like a very simple concept to have available, but but it's actually pretty powerful um, in what it enables, because what it allows is for oops, what it allows for is one slice to be a to provide services to other slices. So now you can we can um, do experiments across Exogenie that um, that 
are multi-domain experiments where the different domains are different slices owned by different users. And we can create these more complicated experiments um, on, the, on a single test bed. Um, we also on Exogeny have a, a concept that we call a stitch port. And what a stitch port is, is a, a way to connect a slice on Exogeny at layer two to something on an external um, domain. So um, two examples that we commonly use are um, stitch ports that go into Duke's software defined science network. So if you remember what um, Jeff talked about earlier, um, across Duke's campus, they have a science DMZ that, that allows um, they use SDN bypass. They, they uses SDN bypass to get from um, a specific uh, laboratory on Duke's campus to the edge of campus at layer two. And um, what we can do with Exogeny is then create layer two circuits that meet with the layer two circuits uh, across the Duke's um, software or uh, SDN bypass. Um, so. Uh, lab, specific labs within Duke can be connected to slices on Exogeny. Um, and in this case, uh, we can actually provide a, have the Exogeny slice provide a service to the Duke campus network. Um, and we can do a very similar thing on the Chameleon testbed. So Chameleon is, a, uh, is an NSF cloud testbed. And it's, it looks, it's similar to um, Exogeny, except it um, is two very, very large sites. Like uh, I think NSF would call it a mid-scale infrastructure. So there's um, about 15,000 compute cores spread out across um, two sites, one at University of Chicago and one at um, University of Texas Attack. Um, and these are, a chameleon is actually bare metal nodes and it has, you know, we're, we were adding, um, Rinsey is now part of the chameleon project and we're adding a lot of the genie style networking functionality to it. And one of the first things we've done is allow stitching between Exogeny slices and slices on chameleon. So what we can do now is we can, what we're going to use this for is to create um, service slices on Exogeny that are gonna be our virtual network service providers and they're going to stitch to other Exogeny slices, um, other slices at chameleon as well as campus infrastructure, for example, Duke. And we're gonna provide networks, we're gonna have, we're gonna be, we're gonna provide a service that is a network service provider to these external domains that are across all these test beds and campuses. Um, so just an example, um, a little bit just to, to archive it, but the, the way the Ahab uh, slice controllers work um, looks a little like this, it's Java code. Um, we basically have a, an object that represents the, the nodes and the networks and the slices and the stitch ports. And you can use pretty simple, straightforward Java commands to um, add different uh, resources to your slice and stitch them together and then commit them. And once you hit commit, then the Exogeny system will, will go ahead and instantiate it for you. Uh, and this is, the, this is how we um, modify our slices over time. So, um, and okay, so what we're gonna do specifically for this project, and this is a little bit more abstract than just the Exogeny, but we'll, we are going to we implement this on Exogeny. Is we're going to create virtual network service providers that are going to connect up um, multiple client domains. And in, in this picture, we just call them client domains. But you you know from our the previous um, couple of slides that these client domains can be other Exogeny slices, other campuses, um, slices on other test beds. It doesn't matter to us. It's all really the same. And and what we're going to do is dynamically um, we're going to dynamically control the inside of the uh, virtual network service provider and allow the different client domains to specify um, policy using the safe logic that, that Jeff's gonna talk about um, soon um, in order to create a virtual software defined exchange where all these client domains can, can exchange traffic between them. Um, we're gonna call our platform that we're gonna to use to, uh, we're gonna call our platform Exoplex. And what this is, is a, uh, a platform for de deploying and experimenting with um, network service providers, virtual network service providers. Um, what this looks like is a, um, a slice controller that is going to control an exogeny slice. And what, the, and what it's gonna control is the creation of nodes and circuits between those nodes all across the exogeny um, testbed. These nodes might be OVS nodes that are, that are um, 
forwarding traffic, they could be bro nodes that are monitoring traffic, they could be stitch ports that are connecting to specific client domains or that, that are either campuses or chameleon or other exogenous slices. Um, there are a few things when we do this. So, so we talked about um, now that we can automate all of this, um, we have to also automate the trust um, invo involved with creating these things. And that's you know, the point of this, this talk and the point of our, of our, of our work. Um, a few points that, we are, that we've been working, for, working with, uh, uh, a, few, a few spots that we've been working on to um, increase the trust. Um, the first one is uh, just the customer peering. So when you, when you use Exogeny and, the, and an Ahab controller to physically connect a layer two, um, the network service provider to a client domain, um, you want to have some policy um, that allows you to reason about the trust you have between that client and that network service provider. Um, and we have mechanisms for that that Jeff will talk about later. Um, we want to uh, have connectivity, like so dynamically control um, the connectivity between client domains. So we're going to dynamically deploy OVS nodes um, and configure the OVS using open flow controllers um, in order to forward traffic between pairs of the domains um, based on the policy that, that safe specifies, that they specify using safe. Um, we want to have a secure routing. So we want to make sure that um, the different domains own the, own the IP prefixes that they claim. Um, and if they don't, then we're, you know, we're not going to forward traffic to them. And we can specify those policies with safe as well. And uh, finally, for this piece of the project, we're going to um, embed network function virtualization service chains into the slice controller or into the uh, network uh, service provider. So the different client domains will be able to specify using safe policy the different network functions that they'd like to have their traffic go through. And for now, we're, we're um, just using Bro and we're deploying Bro to monitor traffic um, on behalf of the client domains. And and then hopefully we can take action based on, like if bro sees something um, that's potentially bad, then the bro can invoke an action that will uh, um, help keep the clients secure and safe. Um, so we have an example that we just um, wrote up in a workshop paper for this for CNERT. Um, and in this example, we have a, a a couple, uh, four slices in this case that are connected to a virtual SDX. Two of the slices are on Chameleon and two of them are other Exogeny slices. They're, they're in pairs, so there's the blue slices and the red slices. Um, and the idea here is the blue slices are trying to, try to transfer files between each other and the red slices are trying to transfer files between each other, but they shouldn't be able to talk, you know, blue, blue nodes shouldn't be able to talk to red nodes and vice versa. Um, so there's two exogeny slices and two chameleon slices. So this shows um, stitching to exogeny as well as stitching to external test beds. Um, yeah, and, it, and we don't actually have in here the stitch to uh, Duke's campus. That doesn't mean we can't do it. That's just in this particular example, we didn't use Duke's campus. Um, but we could have easily used Duke's, camp Duke's campus if we wanted to. Um, so the, the, the specific um, question we had was uh, given um, a particular virtual SDX setup and different slices communicating and having bro monitor the traffic um, for uh, on behalf of the slices. Um, we wanted to figure out how many bro nodes or how, how, how can we get the correct amount of performance out of bro to actually inspect all the traffic? Because as many people know that bro is pretty resource hungry. Um, and when you start running it in virtual machines on in clouds, then it's it's probably it's even worse. So we did some work to figure out the appropriate number of bro nodes and and the, and ways to dynamically um, provision bro nodes in order to um, be able to handle the amount of traffic we currently have. So in this particular example, the chameleon slices are both sending a large file um, to their corresponding slice in Exogeny, and the traffic is being mirrored at the OVS node to the bro the bro service um, and everything was, everything's going well. Um, all the traffic that gets to the exogeny slices are in, has been inspected and everything's safe. Um, then we injected a, a, a malware file so that we had one of the chameleon slices um, 
transfer a file that has malware in it and have Bro detect that malware. Um, even though the, the malware got to the, 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 the final destination, um, very shortly, uh, Bro was able to tell the virtual SDX um, that there was malware and that the, the action that should be taken is to cut off that, that file transfer. And that was all specified using um, safe policy mechanisms. So the, the different um, actors were, were uh, specifying using safe policy. And, um, and, and, and now we're gonna go back to Jeff and Jeff's gonna talk about uh, uh, safe and the trust, the trust logic that um, all of these examples are using. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, okay, so the experiment that, uh, an example that Paul talked about, uh, that was recently, uh, there's a short paper for CNERT, which is a, a workshop that was just last week, reproducible test bed research. Uh, there was a demo there. There's actually a link to code at the end of this presentation, which I understand will be shared. Um, some of the other aspects, campus linkages and so on, have been uh, demoed at supercomputing um, but the, uh, the CNERT one, the, we have uh, all of the, the, the safe logic and declarative logic uh, wired into that. So I want to take a few minutes to try to explain to you what that's about because, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty good basis for an architecture for, for linking together lots of different kinds of cyber infrastructure where trust is fundamental and has to be checked uh, at lots of, lots of different points. And I think the best way to explain it is, is to start by, by popping, popping way, way back to uh, 10,000 feet and just, just give the, the kind of the big picture, which is not specific to SAFE, but also to many other systems and something that you're, you're familiar with, which, which is the idea that we've got lots of participants, principals, right, in a, in a distributed system, a network system. They play different roles. They might be authorities of different kinds, you know, for a, uh, federated infrastructure like Genie, they might be trusted parties out there on the network that are endorsing uh, users or they're endorsing programs or whatever. Um, and they might be just ordinary services that are, that are running and are posting information about actions or choices. So each of these different principles, if, it, if it's uh, endorsing or delegating or whatever it might do, it's, it says some kind of declarative statement which is going to go in to become available to other participants. Uh, they might also specify policy rules in some kind of a, a language. And by declarative, I just mean that it's some representation that, that, that makes a statement or gives a, an inference rule rather than something that's, that's more procedural, although some of them do incorporate procedural aspects. Way on the other side, on the right, you've got somebody who's gonna be pulling in a bunch of those statements and rules and running some kind of an evaluation engine to make some decision about whether some particular proposed action is policy compliant, whether things that have already been done are policy compliant according to policy that's specified declarative for rules. So it might be performing an access control decision, in which case we would call it an authorizer, or it might be checking compliance with policy. And broadly, we like to, you know, you can pass these statements in line with network protocols and so on. We like to think about it in terms of, of having some kind of a global storage infrastructure where all this stuff is stored and you can do a query to pull out the parts that are relevant. And, and that's the model that SAFE pursues. I'll say more about that in just a moment. So one example of this broad kind of design pattern is one that might be familiar to you. Uh, it's uh, gaining traction in the OpenStack community, something called Congress. And Congress offers uh, what they like to call governance as a service. Okay, now in Congress, what happens is that all of these assertions are made by OpenStack services at a particular OpenStack cloud site. And the evaluation on the right side is the Congress service, which is running also at that OpenStack cloud site and evaluating compliance with policy rules that are installed by the local administrator. And the store in the middle is a, is a database. It's an ordinary relational database that stores assertions about virtual machines and networks and other kinds of infrastructure allocated from this OpenStack site uh, in tables. Okay, now Congress, one reason why Congress is relevant to SAFE is that Congress uses data log logic, uh, a standard logic language, a declarative logic language, been studied in the research community for many, many years. 
and uh, is similar. Some of you might have experience with Prolog, if you've done any logic programming in Prolog. Data log is sort of a pure form of, of Prolog. And you can, say, you can say almost anything that's worth saying in data log. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's very powerful, uh, but yet it's the most powerful uh, declarative language that is still tractable provably tractable. So that's one reason why we lock, like it. It's sort of simple and well-defined. And that's one reason why Congress likes it. But it's very useful for specifying security policies. But in Congress, all this stuff is uh, centralized, right? This is one OpenStack site. And we want to be able to do this kind of thing in a decentralized system. So again, the view from 10,000 feet, we just have a slight variation of the same picture. You know, the network principles now have to be, they're out on the network. We can't control them, all, not all locked down in one site. So we're gonna need some way to authenticate them. And they, so they need unique names and we might have some other authority that you know, binds a session or something to a unique name as in Shibboleth, but it's typical in these systems that the network principles authenticate with key pairs. That's what we're doing in SAFE. Everybody's got a key pair, there's a public key. Uh, so they're gonna be um, you know, applications. You know, really these principles are represented by applications running on their behalf. And they're going to make various assertions or make statements of policy. And in a decentralized system, the store has to be decentralized and secure. A lot of different ways you can do it. Blockchain systems fall into this pattern. Uh, and, uh, but you can also store things on websites and hit them with a secure web. There's a lot of work on DHT systems for decentralized uh, key value stores. And uh, on the right side, of course, in a decentralized system, we again have lots of different principles that might be acting as clients. Cl clients and servers might be checking. Uh, clients might be checking to see if servers are trusted. Servers are checking to see if they can give access to clients. Um, peers might be checking. We even use this stuff for, um, you know, for paying money and having contracts in, in blockchain systems. If you squint a little bit, this is a blockchain system that we're looking at. Uh, if, you know, that's a particular kind of storage structure. But these kinds of, um, you know, we can represent all kinds of trust information um, with assertions and policies, you know, endorsements and delegations, assertions of attributes for a particular principle, um, naming them by key pair or, or public key hash rather, uh, as in blockchains, any kind of delegation of trust um, and even payments and contracts. So there are lots of different internet infrastructure systems that really broadly, again, squinting 10,000 feet follow this kind of pattern. DNSSEC follows this pattern, right? All of the uh, name servers sign their, their name bindings. Um, these are simple declarative statements. Um, and these are stored in a, in a web of uh, servers that are, that are linked together in various ways according to the trust structure of DNSSEC. Um, the, the certifying authority PKI structure is also like this, although those certificates are generally stored locally and passed in line. Um, and, uh, you know, Ethereum and blockchain systems also are like, are like this. So what we're going to do in SAFE is we're probably going to follow this model. Um, we've got principles represented by applications, posting logic facts and rules, uh, making assertions. These are going to have to be authenticated uh, under key pairs. And so what we use is we, we store them in certificates. We use certificates as a transport for data log logic, very much like, like Congress. It's uh, got a syntactic addition to uh, data log as in Congress, where each statement has um, a speaker that, that, that is the principal identity of the uh, entity or principal that, that made the statement. And these are carried through by signing. Um, they're, they're stored this way in the store, uh, a global certificate store, so that um, you know, the, the storage servers can't forge them. Uh, now the actual store, we use a key value storage model, which is a lot more scalable than a blockchain. It doesn't require a total order. And the uh, certificates are actually linked, linked together. But we also have support in SAFE to be able to store certificates on uh, HTTPS websites and be able to fetch them by links. Um, but what we're pursuing is a, is a decentralized KV store model um, following a system that's, that's now some years old called Phalanx. And, and that's work in progress. Uh, but of course, on, on the right side, the different uh, principles represented by applications can pull content and certificates out of the store and uh, cache it, rip the, rip the crypto, 
and then feed it to a logic engine. So safe is, you know, it's a custom format. This is the part where sort of the actionable security goal of uh, the content of these webinars, we have to step back from it. Nobody uses this stuff. People in the, in the research community have been looking at logical trust for years. It's very convenient and powerful. Uh, actual useful operational deployments are uh, elusive. And so we're trying to overcome that by building a system infrastructure around that. But the logic is sufficiently powerful to model the structure of, uh, and uh, decisions and validation procedures of lots of kinds of internet infrastructure. RPKI for prefix ownership, BGP sec for secure routing, DNS sec for secure naming, the trust structure of Genie. Again, Genie is all custom certificate formats, but it all boils down to about 200 lines of uh, logical scripting in the SAFE system. So SAFE has an off-the-shelf data, data log engine. It's open source, it's called Styla. Um, has some caching software and various modules to fetch logic content from different sources and uh, authenticate that content and then feed it to the prover. Um, I'm short on time. Uh, I just sort of figure out kind of what to tell you and what not to tell you. Um, again, the key point is that we have a certificate format that's a payload for logic content. I think we won't be able to get into the, the logic language. I have a couple of examples here. Again, if you're, if you're familiar with logic or prologue, it's, it's very, uh, you know, from philosophy 101. Uh, this will all be, look familiar to you, but I can do various kinds of constrained delegations from trust anchors. Um, I can publish lots of different kinds of endorsements and statements. I have to, all the speakers and the relying parties have to agree on a vocabulary of predicates constant names and so on. Um, we use public key hashes for principal names just like the blockchains, um, but any kind of a principal name that's, that's known unique across all principles will work as far as the logic prover is concerned. Um, so, you know, the statements and rules look something like this. A speaker, that would be a public key hash, says, and here's a rule, it says, well, I'll accept any X, that's a universally quantified variable, if uh, Cindy says that X has property P. And, you know, the vocabulary of predic predicates is sort of arbitrary. We have to agree on that among all the parties, but very simple to represent, uh, very powerful um, trust information with logic. So in the uh, CNERD experiments and in the slides that uh, for the virtual software defined exchange that Paul showed you, we are using logic for several different purposes. One of them is to um, show that somebody who is registering a subnet prefix as a customer of a virtual network at attaching to the edge with dynamic stitching is in fact the owner of that prefix. RPKI is one way to do that. And we have sort of a homegrown, you know, logic uh, um, with the same certificate content as RPKI, but in logic so that we can run it very easily with the logic based validation rule. And here's an example of the rules, just hierarchical delegation of con contained prefixes rooted in some globally trusted authority like IANA in the case of RPKI. And in our experiments, we're kind of making this stuff up, right? We uh, create a globally trusted authority, mint a key pair for it and add rules and everybody that says that they trust it as the root of management of the IP namespace. Um, so some steps to take to connect that to an operational deployment. But we can do uh, subnet containment in, in data log. Arithmetic operations generally can be problematic, but it, it, that, that's actually tractable and, and easy to do. Um, we're also using it to uh, allow owners of IP prefixes to make statements that they are advertising routing control for those prefixes to the virtual network. Those statements get passed through and can be evaluated by another attaching customer to validate that in fact, not only does appear through the network own a particular prefix, but also that they have uh, they have statements directly from the peer delegating routing control to the virtual network saying that this, this virtual network coming in through this circuit attached at your edge is a valid way to get to this peer. And that models the structure of uh, BGPSEC. And again, the rules for checking routing paths, um, very easy to capture with logic. Um, our implementation of this is actually based on some research that was done by uh, Boon Lu, who's done uh, Boon Tao Lu at UPenn, who's done a lot of uh, work on logic-based uh, um, network, network policy and, and network, uh, network operations. Um, 
So let's see, I think I'll, I'll skip this, but um, uh, we can validate that the prefixes are valid. Uh, and we also use the logic to do um, access control for peering, who's permitted, whose virtual network is it permitted to actually attach at layer two, stitch to the virtual network service provider. Um, it could be a test bed slice owned by somebody in the experiments for CNERT, they're all test bed slices owned by somebody, Genie and Chameleon test bed slices. Could also be an edge network uh, subnet on a campus or some facility on a campus. And the idea of these logic policies is that every customer network is uh, controlled by some authority. If it's a campus subnet, it would be controlled by the campus network operations. If it's a test bed slice, uh, in the Genie trust structure, there's something called a slice authority that has to certify each slice and may assert attributes about it. And every slice is bound to a project, which is some approved uh, you know, project or research activity with a PI who's accountable for the actions of that. And there may be various attributes associated with the project that are asserted by the project authority. So what we can do is implement edge policies, things like um, you know, some, somebody can stitch to a virtual network only if they, their, their slice, you know, the, the virtual network that they're stitching to the virtual service provider is a virtual network that whose authority is trusted and whose authority has asserted that that network is associated with a particular group of PIs or a particular project and where that particular project is accepted as one that is um, you know, within an access control list for attaching to that virtual network. We can do other kinds of things. For example, for virtual data enclaves, we can say that only edge networks that are asserted by an approved slice authority, a campus or a test bed authority as having a particular attribute like um, eligibility to carry census data or something like that can actually be attached. And then the idea is that we can preserve those properties at uh, all the way end to end across the entire um, private private virtual network. Uh, so we, we implemented a bunch of policies. We did some tests based on those. There's uh, a little bit of data in the CNERT paper. I don't think I have a slide for you, but this just gives you an idea of the complexity. You know, how many different statement types, sort of different things that we've tried out, how many different statement types there are. The chain lengths are actually variable. It depends, you know, how many delegations. We're talking about a single virtual network service provider here. If you hook up uh, you know, multiple ones in a peering chain, which you can do with this platform, then um, obviously the routing chains are gonna be longer and those will take a little bit longer to check. But in general, um, you know, these certificates have to be fetched from some kind of a store. They're linked together in a scripted way under safe. I didn't really talk about that. So you kind of pull on a, on a link and you get all the relevant certificates and then you run a validation procedure that essentially makes a proof that what you're doing is compliant according to some policy. Um, the, the last piece of that is the connectivity that customers can actually supply logic policies that um, specify the attributes of other customers that they're willing to talk to. Um, and that way we, we can control the permitted flows in the network. Those are checked and approved at attachment time and we generate from those SDN rules that are loaded directly onto SDN switches within the network service provider. And that's where uh, the permitted flows are actually enforced and not with a logic proof on every single operation. Okay, well, I'm out of time. Um, so we'll just, uh, I've got some more slides on safe if anyone wants to ask me a question. But just to kind of wrap it up, um, we have, uh, what we've tried to do really is sort of uh, factor out the common needs that we might have for any kind of virtual network service provider that's deployed in this network architecture of the future and uh, sort of provide a platform and an architecture for those that, that addresses all of those con all of those concerns. So that what you have to do to deploy a virtual network service provider is write an AHAB size controller. It's a Java program, it uses Genie APIs to go out and uh, allocate resources. Um, and you know, through ExoGenie, we proxy through to the circuit providers for the backplane. Uh, it uses, uh, it can invoke into the uh, nodes running within the vet virtual network service in order to install bro rules, things like that. Um, but it has an API for launching bro nodes and allocating pipes and stringing things together. Calls northbound APIs of a uh, SDN controller running an open vSwitch within the slice in order to implement routing rules. 
Routes are centrally, uh, centrally coordinated. I think we didn't talk about that within the controller. We've got some libraries for that. Um, and uh, part of that, of course, is um, to have support for the various security demands uh, in terms of managing authorization and trust. And, and for that, we use uh, a standard, common, unified logic representation and infrastructure for doing that. Uh, we've done some experiments with that. Paul talked about that a little. Um, and again, I think there's, uh, well, we got a bunch of backup slides, but you can, um, you know, you can follow this link and I, I think you get all the code for the demos that were done at Senior at last week. And with that, I'll stop and we're happy to take questions. Thank you all for your attention. I'm sorry for running a little bit over here. We've still got a few uh, minutes to take questions. And for those of you who are interested in accessing this link, uh, I'll be posting the slides uh, later today. So if you want to pass this along. Um, but uh, we'll go I ahead. Think we're also going to um, arrange to have a link to that paper and to these slides on the uh, exogenie.net website. I don't think it's up there now, but you can always go to exogenie.net and you know, there's a blog there and stuff and we'll put some of this stuff up there. Great. Thanks for doing that. Um, so if, if anyone has any questions, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat. Uh, I just want to go over a few uh, items of business. So let me just stop this, the share and uh, pull up my slides here. Uh, so if you have any questions, go ahead and please type them into the chat. Also, please take our survey. We like to hear your feedback, but also if you have a presentation that you would like to share with us, or uh, if you have a, a suggestion for a presenter, uh, please go ahead and take uh, the time to fill that out. Here's the link to the survey. Uh, and then let me just quickly uh, mention that next, our next webinar is uh, May 21st. We're doing it a week early than, earlier than usual because of the holiday. So be on the lookout for announcements of that presentation. And we've got a question here from Jim. Yeah. Thanks so for, oh, uh, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just read it real quick. Uh, thanks for the informative presentation. Can SAFE support compliance with NIST 800-171 for research on controlled unclassified information across secure campus cloud research data enclaves? Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, it gives me, uh, gives me an opportunity to um, once again, thank NSF for support. There are, there are two projects ongoing that I haven't talked about. Um, one is there's an SATC, you know, Secure and Trustworthy Cyberspace uh, Frontier project called Silver that has funded the safe work. And also there's, we have a DIBS uh, led by Ilya Balden at RENC that's looking at, at using SAFE as part of a larger um, architecture called IMPACT for managing this kind of uh, data use compliance. And so the specific answer to your question, we're very interested in dealing with these kinds of regulatory compliance uh, in both of those projects and we talk about it a lot. Um, and something concrete is happening in the DIBS impact project. These kinds of, um, you know, the NIST uh, Mumble Mumble 171, a lot of that has to do with, with whether all the various PIs who are accessing data have signed off on various data usage agreements. And um, so we are uh, looking at integrating SAFE better with some um, infrastructure, including CI logon, as a way to enable the various uh, participants to attach to a, a notary service that issues uh, logic certificates as they fill out usage agreements and so on, issue certificates certifying that uh, certain boxes have been clicked on under certain secure identities. And then those fill into a, a feed into an access control check made at the actual um, data, data providers, which is, was a collaboration with the Dataverse group on that. So that's work in progress. It's still in relatively early stages, but that's definitely a direction that's uh, very important to us. Um, more broadly, uh, we just had an interesting workshop in the Silver Project with a couple of commercial cloud providers um, representatives, representatives of AWS and VMware talking about compliance with um, related NIST uh, policies. I think there's a, was it, um, uh, 700, uh, um, where uh, compliance for their customers and for their infrastructure is, is based at least in part on third-party auditing. 
um, people who come in and inspect data centers and so on. And those kinds of things can be captured. You need, you know, you got to connect to the real world somewhere. It's the same as what we have in a lot of these blockchain trading applications. You know, somewhere there has to be somebody who makes an assertion that, yes, I'm a trusted party. Here I have signed under my key. I inspected this data center and it's compliant. And then we can feed those into checking higher level compliance requirements, which are essentially logical rules. They're basically conjunctions of low level certifications for all of these different um, aspects. I hope I answered your question. Yep, looks like it. Uh, do we have any more questions from the attendees? Just wanna take a last call. Okay, well, uh, I think we'll wrap, it, we'll wrap things up because uh, I know you've got places to be. So I just wanted to thank uh, both of you for presenting this month. And uh, I, go ahead, sorry. I just said thank you, it's our pleasure. Great. Great. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and stop recording here. <laughs>